This program is funded by the Annenberg CPB Math and Science Project. It has been produced in collaboration with the National Science Foundation, Harvard University, and the Smithsonian Institution. But the part that bothers me the most is that by every indicator that I see, we are not effective in the overall education and learning of our youth. And we are paying a tremendous amount of money for it. And no one talks about it. One of the key ways we think is metaphorical or analogical. So for instance, we might have a hard time understanding an abstract idea like love. So what we do subconsciously and automatically is think of love as a journey. And we talk about spinning our wheels, taking a wrong turn, flying high, because that experience in traveling helps us to understand this abstract idea. Science is about making predictions about the world. It's not about explaining. Just because you can explain something doesn't mean that you understand the science. You have to be able to predict what will happen. That's the power of science. I think we're teaching knowledge in bits, chunks, fragments. Meaningful understanding means not learning something in a shallow way, like a friend's telephone number. You keep it in your mind long enough to dial it, and then it's gone. How do we know a kid really understands something in science? Well, we try to teach them something, and then we construct our tests so that they do well. So if you have a very difficult idea that may take two or three years to learn, and you cover it in two weeks, you want the kids to do well on the test. So you have to test things that are trivial. All young children know how to learn to construct meaning. That's the way they acquire the language, without any special coaching. But when they get in school, they start learning to memorize, learning to pass tests, rather than learning for understanding, then the problem begins, and it continues right through university. Cambridge, Massachusetts. Graduation day at Harvard and MIT. Here's a seed. Okay. Okay. Now hold on to that for a second. Okay. Imagine that I planted that in the ground. Okay. And a tree grew. All right. And here is a piece of that tree. Sure. Okay. Now, where did all that stuff come from? So where do plants come from? You look at these beautiful big redwood trees, these great spreading valley oaks, and you know they start from this little tiny seed. It's miraculous. Where does all that weight come from? Uh, the mass came from a lot of things, I'd guess. I'd guess from water that it sucked up from the ground. I would guess from minerals that it sucked up from the ground. Water, light, soil. Well, I, I mean, I suppose in terms of just in terms of raw mass, most of it's probably derived from actually like matter in the soil itself, and uh, some of it comes from water, obviously, um, but a large amount of it comes from the, the nutrients that the I guess the roots uh, absorb from the soil. 
Now, what would you say to someone who said to you that most of the weight of the tree came from the carbon dioxide in the air? I would say I would have no idea. I'd have to think about that. I would disagree because this same volume of air wouldn't weigh this much unless it was highly compressed. I would say that's very disturbing and um, wonder how that could happen. It's a very strange idea that somehow the air, which they view as nothing, as weightless, as insubstantial, somehow makes a tree, a giant tree that weighs several tons. I mean, that's absolutely incredible. That'd be hard to believe because carbon dioxide is, well, it's a gas and it doesn't seem like, it doesn't seem intuitive that you could add mass taking in a gas. But that's where it comes from takes those carbon molecules and packs them together via chemical reactions so tight that you get this huge mass. So what does it mean that these Harvard graduates don't understand the fundamental idea of photosynthesis? Well, it's symbolic of the state of the nation. These are the best that we produce. They don't understand it. After all these years of school, who does? Perhaps by examining the way our students are taught, we can uncover some insight to this dilemma. Uh, hold it up so I can see. A little more, yeah. Bob Holden, an experienced science teacher in Melrose, Massachusetts, has agreed to let us watch as he teaches photosynthesis to his seventh grade class. Okay, uh, I see a problem over here. Before the six-day unit begins, okay, so we interview cool. Bob's students to find out what they already okay. know about the subject. Fifteen pounds. Okay. Like Ten, fifteen pounds. <laughs> if we teach photosynthesis in elementary school, in middle school, in high school, in college, and people don't get it, how do we figure out what the problems are? Well, one of the things that's happened in educational research is that we used to look at huge groups of people and get averages. That's like trying to study a mountain chain by looking at averages. You lose all the peaks and the valleys. So what we do now is to look at an individual struggling to understand. And often it helps to look at a bright individual struggling to understand because they're good. You would expect, if anyone would do it, they would. One of Bob's best students yeah. is John Federico. How much do you think that weighs? Oh, I'd say um, as much as, uh, you know, a newborn baby, about, you know, five, six pounds. Okay. Just as an estimation. What did it need to grow? Uh, number one, uh, usually all plants and animals need water mm -hmm. to grow. It's a basic thing of life. Um, no one can live without it. Sunlight, uh, it, it, you know, gives it energy. Mm -hmm. uh, soil, minerals from the soil, because that's where the roots can grow out and collect it from. Mm -hmm. I guess, I guess that's about it, basically. John's ideas about what plants are made of are similar to the Harvard and MIT graduates. He mentions water, sunlight, and soil, but not carbon dioxide. We will interview John again after the unit is finished. What is in a leaf as a result of photosynthesis? Food, very good. The focus of the class is on how plants make food. The plants need energy too, right? So where do they get their energy from? From the starch they make. After Bob's introductory lecture, the class divides into teams and begins three days of lab experiments. Well, the kids learn when they do something hands-on much more than they do if they're just, you know, reading out of a book or something like that, or just lecturing to them, or even a film. Hands-on is the best. No, I want, to, I want you to see this. Oh, it worked out of hypothesis because it wouldn't turn. When the students have finished their lab work, Bob sums up what the experiments were designed to show. Earlier in the year, to bond together the molecules, the atoms. In six class periods, the students have completed the required seventh grade photosynthesis curriculum. One month later, we interview John again. 
Bob Holden watches the interview on tape. Well, in about a pound lighter, pound, pound, pound and a half. We are interested in finding out how John's ideas about photosynthesis have changed. Yeah, John did uh, very well in my class. He was very open. Fun kid to have in class. A teacher appreciates that because they can kind of read the kid a little bit better as to how he is doing. Can you remind me what you said the air has to do with trees? Um, the air is part of a cycle called photosynthesis. It helps make energy for the trees. Okay, and what is it using from the air? Um, the carbon dioxide, which produces oxygen. So it's mainly using carbon dioxide. Now, you had told me something about a photosynthesis equation. Do you remember it? And if you do, can you write it down for us? Okay. Um, sunlight, water, plus carbon dioxide produces um, oxygen, new water, and energy. Now, last time you said to me that the tree it was made out of about 60% water and 40% soil minerals. Yeah. What would you say now if I asked you what that tree was mostly made out of? 60% water and 40% of the rest. Definitely. Um, Maybe even more than 60% water. 70, 75% water. John already knew when he walked in the door that sunlight and water and soil were involved in growing plants. And that's what he knew when he walked out the door. And all the minerals and soil and stuff like that. You still got the soil in there. The missing piece that they take carbon from the air and make them into huge trees didn't get assimilated. I don't know what happened. I tried to draw it together showing molecules and uh, we had studied molecules, and yes, there's the starch molecule, and it's turning into sugar, and I, I thought I made it clear. Okay. Alcohol's that yeah. way. Ten yeah. seconds. Yeah. Why didn't Bob's teaching get through to John? Perhaps the answer lies in what John already knew when Bob started teaching him. The most important thing for a teacher to know is what their students are thinking, what they come to class with. Unless you know what people's prior ideas are, you have very little chance of ever changing them. You mentioned carbon dioxide and you mentioned oxygen. Do you have any concept of what they are? They are um, elements that help things grow and move and uh, make food. And yep. Do they have any kind of weight, do you think? No. No. You sure? OK. How come you don't think they have weight? Because right now, you and me are breathing in oxygen. Mm -hmm. And if it had any weight, then we couldn't breathe it in. John's belief that air doesn't have any weight seems to be blocking his ability to understand the central point of photosynthesis. Yeah, so far that's what it seems like, that it's, you learned that equation, but he didn't make the connection with the overall concept. You ready? Yeah. Okay, I want you to hold that. Our interviewer presents John with some dry ice, frozen carbon dioxide, <laughs> to see if she can yeah. convince him that air does have weight. Yeah. We do our best to make sense of the world, and some of those ideas work for us and work well over the years. We go into a science class, and they tell us this very counterintuitive thing, and they expect us to believe it. Why should I give up my good idea to believe your silly idea? Do you know what dry ice is? No. Here you go. Not like specifically, no. It's ice that's dry, maybe. Does it um, have weight to it when you hold it? A little bit. OK. I'll take it back from you. What would you say if I told you that this is carbon dioxide? I'd be very surprised. <laughs> Why? Well, because it had weight. It's frozen carbon dioxide. And now, what do you think's happening to it? It's giving off some sort of smoky substance. It might be melting. If it was, if it was an ice cube, what do you think is going to be left? Oh, after a while, water, a puddle. Okay. 
It's not water. It's made of carbon dioxide. So you got any clues what might be left now when it melts away? Like just carbon dioxide molecules. No. I hope I didn't ruin him by teaching him facts. <laughs> this kid is a good thinker. What would you say about air not weighing anything? I say um, in some cases I might be right, but in some cases I might be wrong. <laughs> You're hedging your bets. Um, why would you maybe be right and maybe be wrong at the same time? Well, if it's not in that solid substance, mm -hmm. it's in a gas substance. Mm -hmm. So when it's in gas substance, you can't feel it. But when it's in a solid substance, you can't. Just one missing piece, like not understanding that gases have weight and that air has different parts that can come and go from that air independently of one another, limits an individual's thinking in so many different areas. Like, ready? All that smoke, if you, all that carbon dioxide, if you, like, touched it or tried to pick it up, there would be nothing. Oxygen. One of the things we're starting to discover is that many students can give the right answer, but you, when you ask them why, the way they got to the right answer is more often than not wrong. It worked in this case to get the right answer, and if that's all that matters, okay. But what it reflects is a lack of a deeper understanding of the idea. And that is the Achilles heel. That is our weakness, this focus on right answers. John is a bright boy, and he obviously is very uh, creative, and he thinks, and he didn't get it. We try to teach probably 10 times more what kids can actually learn in a science classroom. Which we did earlier in the year. And that means taking in huge amounts of information at one time, which the best strategy is memorization. They know how to cram. You hear them talking about it. They memorize for a test. They want to know exactly what kind of questions you're going to ask so they can be ready to answer them. It's a very shallow, unproductive kind of learning. And that's what our brightest students do best, because that's where the payoff is. But at the end of this 20-year process, what do they have to show for it? Very little knowledge. I heard a high school principal at a national meeting in Washington say, we have a firm school policy at our school that all tests have to be given on Friday so the students won't forget over the weekend. And I'm thinking to myself, what a fragile, perishable thing it is that you're producing. There is no way for uh, a young person to understand what's in a high school physics book or chemistry book or biology book. It's simply impossible for kids to learn all of that stuff in a year. I know of no student that I've ever interviewed or worked with who actually came to learn all of that science, or even half of that science. At the most, they might learn 10% of it. So it's sort of a sham to think that we're teaching the whole thing when the most we can possibly teach is perhaps 10%. Parents have to be asking their child all the time, are you really learning to understand or are you just learning to pass the test? 19. You go to 19, 19 then. 19 okay. But there are reasons the why walk. teachers the teach the way they do. 108. Okay, then go to page, go to page 109. Gonna have to we talk with Jay Chandler, who teaches honors chemistry. What we're talking about in terms of are they strong, weak, or non-electrolytes. I feel I don't have time to set aside a huge chunk to really looking at any one issue as much as I'd like to. I have to really feel hidden issue, then go on. on the blank. 
Yeah, yeah, we'll finish that. That's a 25 from the book. Why'd you take that, though? I'm so pressed for time to get to so many things so students can do well on all the topics that are on the exams they may take. Mm -hmm. And I know I'm leaving some kids with some misunderstandings and some ideas that just aren't right. I just don't seem to have time to get them because I feel such a press for time. I don't understand how you know if it's a salt or if it's a non-electrolyte. Because it says that most salts are strong electrolytes. These are salts. There's a test that these students are going to want to take for admission to colleges and universities, and that's the uh, chem achievement test. And a lot of the stuff we teach in honors is geared to students doing well on the chem achievement test. Molarity, Molarity equals what? Moles per liter. You guys have all the tools for this. So what we need to have to measure two things from this problem. The two things we need are both the number of moles that we have and the number of liters. Yeah. So you don't add the potassium chlorate or the... No, we just broke those down into ions. We care about the ions. We took, all we care about is ions. You know, honor students are very right answer conscious, and they'll work diligently to get that right answer. All of this ties in with, with the image that science has given in, in school classrooms, and all too often, um, it's not just in classrooms, but I think throughout society, science is regarded as being objective and correct and hard, and it is the right answers. This point two. Okay, how are we doing? Oh, it's I don't know. No, you don't know. Point two. Tell me, how many moles What's of... What's the answer? Excuse me. Let's do one at a time here. Wait, can you just read off the answers? What's my total moles of ions? 0.045. 0.045. And the last one is 1.782 molar. I'd like you to try those on your own. I don't want to go over another one. I want to try those. Have you tried those on your own? I don't like asking why questions on tests. I spend so much time covering a concept. Then I ask the question why, and I get back so many different answers. It's sometimes very depressing to see some of the answers that you get back when you ask why questions. They're valuable, but it's, as a teacher, it's sometimes very frustrating to see some of the reasons students think a certain scientific phenomenon takes place. Well, teachers are in a bind because there's a lot of pressure to cover a tremendous amount of material. There's pressure for coverage in schools. And yet, the research shows that when you cover so much stuff, the kids learn very little. Can you tell me what's inside of there? Um, probably air, like oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide. Joy's a sophomore. She's a very active student in class, in a good way. She's a very bright student, very hardworking student, and she's in my honors chemistry class. As an honors chemistry student, Jody is expected to yeah, understand oh, how molecules are arranged in solids, oh, liquids, and gases. Um, if it was really close. Okay, well I know water is made up of H2O, which is hydrogen, and two oxygens, so there's no real like space between them. So I guess it'd all be kind of like that. Like, there wouldn't really be any room between them. When you say there's no space between them, can you explain that to me a little further? I just, I don't, I don't think they would get any closer because they really can't. Do you draw from me on the bottom kind of a, a sketch of maybe some water molecules as a gas and some okay. water molecules as a liquid. Well, I think that when you when you heat it, the molecules break up. So say this would be like a hydrogen, and this would be an oxygen, and this would be an oxygen. And so then they all, I don't know what the stuff Instead is. Instead of thinking water molecules spread yeah. further apart, and, um, Jody thinks they, they break up into break atoms. Up and they spread out, and they, that's the whole diffusion thing where they're trying to find their own space. So, now, how about in a solid? I guess I would think that it would look like like a liquid because it's still hydrogen and oxygen and two oxygens. I don't know if it would look different here than here. I think it's just warmer here. I don't know. I don't know. So you look at a student like Jody, bright, hardworking student, to get that far along and not have a sense water is more dense than ice because ice floats on top of water and therefore the molecules must be further apart. It's leaping over the basic understanding to this high but superficial level of performance. She's a good student but she's still confused about the basics and she's not alone. Fewer than 40% of college chemistry majors can explain solids, liquids, and gases in terms of the particles that make them up. 
We did a study where we followed children from grade one right through high school. And we found that when we helped them understand certain basic science concepts in grades one and two, this influenced their learning all the way through high school as compared with students that didn't have that instruction. Well, there are, there are fundamental ideas that have a big payoff for students that apply to lots of different scientific areas. And one of them is thinking that matter is made out of particles. Put the water in. Yeah, put the water in first and then put... This is Jean Huff. Yep. Her science supervisor has asked her to teach a unit on particles and matter to a third grade class. Right now. And she said, and we're going to do mystery powders. I said, oh, God, I don't know anything about that. I won't be able to do it. It disappeared. <laughs> How could that be? And I thought, but I can't tell Maxine. I don't know anything about this stuff. You know, I, I, I never took physics in college or anything, yes. or high school even. Yes. And so, um, so I went to the library, and I got every book I could find in the children's department so I would at least know something. What are the three categories that all things in the world are basically divided into? Alice, do you want to turn your seat around a little bit? Um, I think it's important for kids to begin to play with the idea solids, and that gases. the things they see every day are made out of little tiny particles. If you hang up a wet towel and you come back later and it's dry, it's important to realize that the matter, that the substance, the water, didn't just disappear, it went somewhere else. And all of chemistry is dealing with where do these things go? Uh -huh. What happened to the water in it? It would have um, evaporated up into the um, air. What else do we know about the molecules or the, about a solid? Alice? That they're all scrunched up like this? They're all scrunched up. Alice is a sweet, poetic, um, endearing child. You think the molecules are different in the solid and the liquid when they're in yes. ice and in water? They're different, yes. They're different. They are. How are they different? Well, this couldn't be a liquid because it's all crunched up mm -hmm. like a solid. Yeah. And this couldn't be a solid because it's all like a liquid. Except if you froze this, then it would be this. Liquid, it, it tr changes its shape when you pour in because it, it's moving around a little more. George is, is <laughs> he's unique. <laughs> no gases you can't see, so they poof all over the place, fly around. Air is a gas, you can't see it, and it's flying all over. Yeah. Matthew Francis. <sighs> gases are, gases molecules are made, are, they, they want to go so far apart that, um, that, because they don't want to be around each other because they don't like being crowded, like scrunched up mm -hmm. like solids. I think all of the time, if, you, if you're dealing with a class full of children, then almost inevitably you're making, you, you, you start making assumptions about what those children can do, what they can't do, uh, assumptions about whether they can deal with abstract ideas or whether they, they cannot deal with those abstract ideas. Um, my own feeling on this, having seen these one-on-one -on -one interviews with kids, is that I feel that in normal, everyday classrooms, we, be, we don't begin to, to touch the, the potential that the kids have in being able to think through difficult problems uh, and to reason. One, two, three, a hundred pennies on this one piece of aluminum foil without it sinking. I said, well, I have some very smart kids and I know my kids can do it too. So are you guys willing to try this? Audrey Sturgis is a sixth grade teacher in an urban school. Until now, she has only taught social studies. But this year, her school system added science to the curriculum. They learn nothing else from me in science. I want them to leave my room knowing I can accomplish anything. I put my mind to it. I don't care what color I am. I don't care where I live. I can do that. That's the most important thing. Water. Water's getting in. Why do you think that is? 
Because maybe um, they're all in the middle. They're all in the middle. So what do you think you should do? Spread them, spread them take out. Because when it's all in the middle, it's pushing it down this way, and it goes closer. Then. Excellent. Excellent. I, I like the thought of, of starting with kindergarten kids and giving them giving them the opportunity to explore. And I just find it so exciting that what her kids are able to do in third grade. And I would love it when they got to sixth grade, at least they've heard the word, even if they don't remember the definition. And what a great way to work on self-esteem, you know? Because they kind of lose it in middle school. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. 16. And concepts are really hard. The abstract ones are really tough. I don't put a lot of importance on it in sixth grade. I think it would be more important in eighth grade when they have to deal with it when they get up to the high school. A good scientist takes their time. Audrey is not convinced that her sixth graders are ready for science fundamentals. Let's see if we have a winner over here. What do you think? What's your prediction? It's gonna work. It's gonna yeah. work. I like that attitude. Okay, that's a big moment. Cross, cross, one, two, three, let go. Oh, man. You guys are so close. You're so very close. I don't understand the question. Okay. You mentioned that I have air. This is Audrey's student, Chris. Okay, I'm the the air interviewer air has air presented air him with a question he has never been asked in school. He's a good student. Um, he likes to be challenged, um, but he wants to know the answer. You can't leave him with something open-ended. Chris has just watched a demonstration in which air in a piston is squeezed against the thumb. I can't wait to see <laughs> what he has done with this. How old is he, Chris? Uh, Chris is 11. Chris is going to use before and after pictures to indicate what he thinks has occurred in the piston. It's a very abstract question, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, how do you imagine it? If, if, if children have no idea of particles at all in the air, if they had no idea, how do you imagine they would, they would answer? Do you think it's a fair question to ask? Not at my age level, I don't think it is. My kids aren't real w good at doing abstract thinking yet. Right now, everything's basically very concrete. If they can't see it, it does not exist. Mm. And let's say you could see the air inside the syringe. How do you think it would look like? Like little dots. Okay, will you, will you draw those, please? On his own, Chris seems to have picked up the idea of particles along with some notions about their behavior. Do you think there's a difference between the dots at the bottom and the, one, and the ones on the, on the top? More dots, less dots. Where would there be more dots? Huh? Excuse where, me? Where do you think would be more dots? The top, because it's opening up more and it's seeking, sucking up air and it's opening up more. This one, this one's back here, this one's right here. Mm -hmm. And most of the, well, they should have the same, same, because you're just squeezing the dots and you're just pushing together. And that marvelous. Wow. I think you really expressed <laughs> it very well yes. about where he is. Yeah. yeah. At first, it looks as if Chris thinks that squeezing the air has caused there to be fewer particles. That is a difficult question. But he has developed a model for thinking about the problem and works out for himself the number of particles is the same before and after squeezing. But when, when you said, well, if you looked at it through a microscope, I didn't know what he was going to do. And dots, I would never have thought he would have came yeah. up with dots. Yeah. You, you were saying earlier about abstract reasoning. You know, and it, he, was, he was using, abs, you know, it was a model. There's nothing there to be seen that, you know, the yeah. dots aren't there. Now, at that point, he's, he's sort of got a tool for thinking with. Chris is asked to draw what the contents of the flask might look like if half the air were removed. Great. Can you tell me a little more of what, what is the drawing? It's all this, this is all the air, and the air that was up here, you just sucked up. It was going like this, the air, and you sucked it up, and it just stopped right here. I mean, what, what do we imagine he means at that point? Now, I think if you were to ask him what was on top, he'd probably tell you nothing. He probably really thinks that the air is no higher than this level. And all the air is below and there's nothing up top. We shall find out. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what's on the top? On the top? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs>
What is nothing? What do you mean by nothing? Well, air is up there. Air, you know, air just goes everywhere. But I just draw, draw how much air is left in there. How do you think it will look? It's a wonderful <laughs> moment. <laughs> there was, I just put it like this. There was 40 dots in there. Okay. And when you sucked it up, there was only 20. Okay, could you tell me what's the difference uh, between the air on the top and the air at the bottom? The air at the bottom mm -hmm. is telling you what's mm -hmm. left of the air. It's not saying that it's the air that's going to stay down there. And the dots, they're here just to show you that it travels everywhere. The way I was using the two representations, mm -hmm. you know, patiently explaining, I drew it halfway up to show that mm -hmm. half has been taken out, and the dots show where the mm -hmm. air is in the flask. I'm just curious, he's in sixth grade, sixth correct? Grade. You, have you talked about atoms at all, or no? I'd love to know where he gets the idea of those dots from, then. I'm going to ask him. <laughs> I have no idea, yeah. I bet you think it's too abstract for them, don't <laughs> well, you? Well, I did, yeah. until today. Yes. So we have all these different emphases and concerns and constraints. Uh, we have elementary school teachers who are trying to teach science, and yet they don't know it themselves. And that's very scary business, trying to teach ideas that you know in your heart you don't understand and don't have the time to learn because you've got 40 kids seven periods a day and when are you going to spend time learning this stuff? We have other teachers who know there are so many social problems in their neighborhoods that building students' self-esteem and getting them to believe in themselves is their number one issue. So how do we get their attention? to think about the science. And then we have people who are very confident in science, but who think that their job is to teach to the test. And in fact, that may be the number one point of their evaluation. How well do your students do on this test? Two years have passed since we last saw John Federico. <laughs> this is my chemistry book. It, it is so important to like realize that you're just going to have to do good in school to really do good in life. And how does school measure your success? Grades. A's, B's, you know, test grades, quiz grades, that's how they measure my success. My success in being able to sit and, and learn in my that's how they measure my success. Okay, so um, basically we just wanted to... We asked John to reflect on our videotape of his younger self. <laughs> Thoughts about it. Do you know what dry ice is? No. There you go. Not like specifically, no. It's <laughs> ice that's dry. <laughs> Does it um, have weight on it? When you ice it? that's dry. A little bit. Hence the name dry ice. I'll take it back. Um, what would you say if I told you that this is carbon dioxide? It is carbon dioxide. I'd be very surprised. Why? Well, because it had weight. What would you say about air not weighing anything? And I, I, don't, I wouldn't know what to say to a teacher. I mean, it's a hard job. <laughs> <laughs> and Mr. Holden's face when I was talking about that, I, re I felt bad because he made an attempt to really get it across to me. Well, if it's not in that solid substance, mm -hmm. it's in a gas substance. I wasn't getting it. I, I, I probably could do it if, I was a if it was asked to me on a test, but when it came to talking about it... So, when it's in gas substance, you can't feel it, but when it's in a solid substance, you can't. People of goodwill want to please each other. Teachers want to do a good job for their students. Students want to do a good job for their teachers. And then we encounter an idea that's difficult to master, difficult to teach, and the whole thing breaks down. 
Everybody feels like a failure. I don't know. I don't know what I was thinking. I, I, I remember him teaching it, and I know he was a good teacher, and I know he didn't do anything wrong. And I don't think anyone was at fault. I think what the problem was was that I think I didn't have a good, firm stand on the basics. For example, when I was teaching at a university, I was expected to cover a chapter, a lecture. A chapter of a biology book has an enormous number of ideas in it. I knew I couldn't teach those ideas in 50 minutes, but I did my best because that was my job. And the students knew they couldn't make sense of all those ideas in 50 minutes, so they memorized them and took the test because that was their job. It's like you're sitting in a classroom and the teacher is up there and he's writing things on the board and you're, you're getting as much as you can down, but it's never making any sense. We think about what we're doing to our children when they start out in the world so full of curiosity, so full of interest in life, and how does this happen, how does that happen? And we get them in school and we start brainwashing them. And pretty soon, well, by seventh grade, 50% of Americans are turned off on science. They don't even want to deal with those ideas. And their idea of what you do in school is you memorize. You write things down, you regurgitate them back. It has nothing to do with real life. They're going to forget it all when they graduate. That's their idea of what learning is. Now, now we've really gone wrong when we see our kids losing their imagination, losing their curiosity, losing their interest and believing that that's what learning is really all about. And I have to tell you that most of the time I'm haunted by failure. It is incredibly difficult to teach effectively. It is incredibly difficult to get into a person's mind and help them understand the tight logic that is science. Sit, please, now, everyone. I'm going to ask you to hold this on your table. We'll put it up later on. Therese Walduck is beginning a 10-week unit on decomposition with her fourth grade class in Amherst, Massachusetts. words that you are now associating with this process. Let's just put them up here on this paper. And I heard lots of them already. Let's go with them. Rot. Okay. After 25 years, she is radically changing the way she teaches science. When I first started teaching, I, I taught in the traditional manner where I did a lot of the, the talking or the lecturing. And I found the children, t you know, we'd like to think that they learn everything we say from what we say and from what we tell them. And I was finding out that that wasn't happening. Mushy. Mushy. Okay. And Matt, you're next as soon as I get this up. Sometimes you leave something there, bugs crawl under it, and next time you... We have to start with where they are. Because if we don't, we'll just tell them all our ideas, and the ones that match theirs, they'll assimilate, and the ones that don't, will just bounce off. Anybody else have an idea? Okay, Yara? Um, how fast, how long, how long it takes for something to decompose? Okay. Well, when I first started teaching, I, I uh, was little aware of what the learning was going on and more focused on what it was, what material I was teaching, what I was getting across instead of trying to get into their minds and see what they were thinking about. So if you could all, watch where you step, get to your teams at your same tables, and I will bring paper to you, and you can start. Decide on who is your paper, your recorder. Why does it not rot inside a container? Will salt, will salt keep an apple from rotting? Will pepper make an apple sneeze? <laughs> When, an, when a tree dies, how long does it take for it to decompose? What? That's cool. When a tree dies. And if they don't have a question in their minds, then they're just answering something a teacher is asking them. And they're not answering something that they want to learn. They're not finding out something they want to learn, and they're not putting all those pieces together for themselves. 
This is all luck. Are you ready? I'm ready. Why do things decompose? How does salt keep meat fresh? Will an artificial cherry biodegrade? How long does it take after things die to decompose? Yeah. Okay. How long a how long does it take after things die to decompose? How would you set something up like that? How long it takes for something to rot? What are you going to do, do in order to see something like that happen? If well, because will salt keep an apple from rotting? That's one question. If the salt will keep it from rotting. Another question is, will sugar eat an apple? So there are two different experiments. So you shouldn't put them together. If we had three apples, instead of having to waste apples and using four apples, one for each experiment, we can use three apples. There can be one apple that doesn't have anything, and one apple with salt, and one apple with sugar, and we can see what happens. Okay. All right. Yes, what I think you have, what a point I'm trying to make is we have to find out something that Amber said that was so important. We have to find out what it is we're asking. What do we want to know? And then we have to sort out all these other things and say, is this going to tell us that? Okay. okay. How about over here? Okay. Okay, put the bread down. In the following weeks, Therese's students closely observe the process of decomposition. It's very important for students to be able to express what's in their minds and for teachers to really try to come to understand the way kids are thinking. I find that, that children don't always have their ideas neatly formed and I find a lot of what I do with them is helping them clarify their thinking and help them focus on what it is they're trying to say. Tatiana. This is about the bread and water. Well, I'm not completely sure of what I'm thinking about. I'm not well, what my idea is. I'm not sure what my idea is, but something, well, as Yara said, the red has holes, and like on an apple, it doesn't have holes. So on a bread, if you, on bread, if you squeeze it, then it gets all compact. So maybe like on a sponge, the, when you get it full of water, then it holds all the water. And I'm, I don't know what I'm thinking. Something about that in the bread, because the bread is sort of the same thing, has lots of little holes, and the water falling into it, and I don't know, doing something. All right, keep, you know, keep, keep that idea. That's good. I'm glad you shared that with us, because someone, you know, somewhere along the line, that might make sense to you for some reason. That's going to, you're going to find some idea out of that, out of that thinking that's going to make sense to you. So don't let that one go. That's interesting. I think by allowing those questions to go unanswered sometimes allows more thinking about that to happen than would happen in a quick answer. You don't always have to have a complete idea about something. If you have parts, let them sit and stew in your mind a little bit. Does putting down two teas? I'm going to suggest if you think there's any weather connection, you might start right now to start keeping that in your logs. What, dear? It's hard to keep up with all the lights. I'll get it. Okay, that's a good start. Let's start all of them. Play together again. Oh! Oh, hi! Oh, I think there's one in there. I think there's one in that block that you Amber, just Amber, I can't see. Duh! There's no care in there. Yes, there is. Okay. Not in the block there. If it appears chaotic to an outsider, my feeling is if, if the business at hand is going on, then nope. it's, it's not chaos, it's just child noise. What happened to it? I have something to say about this. What? It's about the same. Carrots are roots. Give me so it may not make a difference uh -huh. to put it under the ground. Well, look at the green is well, under the ground. I beat you. I saw Teresa's students are thinking very hard about the scientific process. They're struggling to sort out the variables, which is a hard job for college students. They're thinking about the time involved, the factors that influence the process. They're thinking about how to measure the impact of the different factors. And Therese has never given them explicit instructions about doing that. She simply encouraged them to do what comes naturally so that they themselves 
fall into the role Separated of young milk. scientists. Milk made into a big chunk and the water separated. Probably like the fat from the milk is the chunky stuff. Yeah. Lard. When their experiments are finished, like the students are asked to make sense of what they have observed. Just the same as this one. I wonder what this is in. If kids are struggling to change their ideas, that's a very different looking classroom than one in which kids are memorizing formulas or vocabulary. Because the process of changing your ideas means that you have to build up and defend your prior notions first. So kids get um, very uh, concerned with their ideas and are willing to battle for their ideas. You can't make the leaves fall and the rain come and the snow fall and melt and the flowers bloom. We can't do that. So we're sort of missing nature itself. In some experiments, the point was just to find out what would happen if you put them in different things. Just by nature, it would be like a whole lot more interesting. But that's not the point of the experiment in some of them. What were we trying to find out? Were we trying to find out what nature would do to it? Because there, because if you leave something on the ground, it rots, and nature does that. But if you wet Say you leave something damp and you put it in a dark place and it gets mildew on it. That's not, that's not outside in nature. That's, that's maybe in your closet. Your shoes are getting mildew. It depends what you're trying to learn. Nature can have a way of doing it and you can have a way of doing it too. But you have to know what you want to learn first. Our group, our group is, does air rot apples or does um, dirt rot apples? So we're trying to find out what that means and trying to learn that process, not the nature process of just leaving it on the ground and seeing if it, it rots. What else did we learn? The only comments I want from people now are some statements about we learned. I learned that vinegar does not rot potatoes <laughs> and that water definitely helps the rotting process. Yeah. Apples can rot in almost I'm saying almost anything. Meaning? What do you mean by Meaning that? Meaning that it can rot in air, it can rot on the ground, it can rot in water with Vaseline on it. I'll give you a big green poster board to put your, your idea map on. Uh, it's going to take a little bit of working out and negotiating with this. Somebody in the group is going to always be talking, but not more than one. Mushy moldy and grow should be the first part. It should be right here. Because okay, about the middle. Mushy moldy and gross, you know, is and also fungus. Like, oh, faster and slower. Where should they go? Faster. Their final assignment is to give written form to their observations and defend their conclusions. What it what it means to me is that after discussing what it was they saw happening and talking about it in different ways, now they can put it in and, and writing about it in their own personal logs um, and journals was to now put it into some kind of concrete form that they can then present verbally. It's just one more way of, of showing what it is they understand. Oh yeah, fungus. Fungus is that big one. Yeah, let's put it on this side. Uh, okay, on this side? Okay, that's a good idea. Well, what we did was we put salt, sugar, heat, and it put faster because in heat, it st the stuff goes faster. They're and sharing ideas with each other. And, air, and, and what they come up with in the, as an end result yeah hopefully is what and we animals, want out of any education insects, and that is these and that these concepts are being Down learned all around the top and the side because that's what makes all this happen and change it's, is going to it just looks like a, and sounds like a bunch of categories we didn't we and did it doesn't make much but sense look, just to have we didn't have much categories. we didn't have much wait time to actually get it one at a time wait a minute wait a minute this does make sense because there's sunshine growing water, and when it, after a while all that stuff makes it rot and decompose. And then oh. after it decomposes, and it gets, gets soft and no, it's smelly. Knowledge yeah. is power, and we have got to find a way to empower every one of our citizens. If they understand the basic principles of 
about the world, they will manage their lives better. It isn't abstract, it's reality. This program is funded by the Annenberg CPB Math and Science Project. It has been produced in collaboration with the National Science Foundation, Harvard University, and the Smithsonian Institution. To order video cassettes or other materials, or to learn more about math and science education reform, call 1-800-965-7373 or write the Annenberg CPB Math and Science Collection.